Yes, so I should say that most parts of uh, my talk will be joint work with Vladimir Fock. And yeah, let's start. What is the main goal of my talk? The main goal um, is to describe pitching components in a purely geometric way, meaning to describe the hitching components as a moduli space of some geometric structure, this geometric structure really defined on the surface. And in particular, we would, we would try to get rid of this description from Hitchin, the Hitchin parameterization, which depends on the fixed complex structure, which seems a little bit unnatural. So maybe let me comment on this goal. Let's say that the most simple Hitchin component in the SL2 case is just Teichmüller space. And Teichmüller space is the moduli space of various uh, geometric structures. For example, hyperbolic structures, complex structures, conformal structures. But if you look at higher rank, the Hitchin component can be described in a representation theoretic way, stating that you start, for example, from a Fuchsian representation of your fundamental group into P cell 2 of R, Fuchsian. And then there's a canonical map called the principal map going to PSLNR. And it happens that all these morphisms lie in one component, which is called the Hitchin component. So we have this purely yeah, representation theoretical description of the Hitchin component. And in this paper of 92, Hitchin described um, his component, or the component which has his name nowadays with analytic methods uh, using the theory of Higgs bundles. And in particular, um, he parameterizes one component by fixing a complex structure and then he param parameterizes it by holomorphic differentials. And so the quite natural question he already posed in his paper at the time was, is there a geometric definition of, of, this, of this Hitchin? components. And so in this talk, I, I will give you at least a, a program to answer this question. So I will construct a new geometric structure uh, on the surface, which we call higher complex structure, because in, this, in, the, spa in, the, in the n equals 2 case, for Teichmüller space, actually we, we find the complex structure. So in some sense, we generalize the complex structure and not, for example, hyperbolic structures. And in particular, we will see that we will get rid of um, this fixed complex structure. So for example, if you, if, you, if you look at Hitchin's parameterization for Teichmüller space, so for SL2, we get actually a description of Teichmüller space in terms of holomorphic quadratic differentials. And we know that the cotangent bundle to Teichmüller space is exactly described by quadratic holomorphic differentials. So in some sense, Hitchin's parameterization is um, you choose one point in the Teichmüller space, this is your base point, and you describe your Teichmüller space from the cotangent space at this point, something like an exponential map. So you see, this is of course a possible description, but it's quite unnatural because you choose this base point and then you have this strange exponential map. And so we will see that in our description, so when we define our higher complex structure, we will have some moduli space. And in some sense, when you have one point of our moduli space, its cotangent bundle will be the Hitchin base. So in some sense, this, this, this picture of having something like an exponential map um, will still be valid in the higher rank case. Okay, so as indicated in the title, this higher complex structure, in order to, to define it, we will use what is called the punctual Hilbert scheme, some algebraic tool. And so I will just give two slides, which, which are maybe a little bit technical, just in order to, to answer the question, why the punctual Hilbert scheme? Where does it come from? So actually it comes from the initial 
approach of hitching. So if you look at the Hitchin's approach, the main ingredient in, this, in the Higgs bundle approach is the non-abelian non Hodge correspondence. And here I formulated, yeah, there are several ways to formulate it, and here I formulated it in this way. So you start from a stable Higgs bundle, so you have a bundle V and a Higgs field phi, and then what this non-abelian Hodge correspondence says actually is that there is a unique deformation of your Higgs field phi into a flat connection. And this deformation has this form. So we have your phi, your Higgs field, and then you have H A plus H square phi star, and of course the, the differential. So it is quadratic in H, and A is unitary, so you have some invariant uh, under, under the, the star map, the conjugation. And when you look in coordinates, actually your phi is a one zero differential. So it is holomorphic and it has just a DZ component. And it, that's exactly where actually the complex structure plays a role. And so the key idea is, in order to get rid of this complex structure, you should allow this phi to have two components, phi one and phi two. So I put here the key idea again. So if we look at the same connection, we just try to, to keep as much from Hitchin's idea as possible. But now we allow for two components in phi. When, we, when you look at the flatness condition of this connection, uh, one condition which comes naturally out is that phi one and phi two has to commute. And of course, in all this description uh, of connections, we look always a modulo gauge action. And actually just on phi, the gauge action is just conjugation. So in some sense, at this point, we have a pair of commuting matrices modulo conjugation. And we will see that this is precisely one of many ways to describe the puncture Hilbert scheme. So here the puncture Hilbert scheme appears, and we will see that. So you are doing the PSL 12. Um, so the question from the audience is, if, if you are in the PSL 2R case, um, no, it's, no, no, it's completely general. Okay, so here's the, the Hilbert, Hilbert scheme comes here. Um, but maybe you, you may notice that uh, when we look at the Hitchin section, um, we have now too many parameters because still we have all the degrees of freedom for phi one as for Hitchin, but now we have a second matrix which computes with phi one, but this gives too many degrees of freedom. And so we add, um, we add another restriction saying that phi one has to be nilpotent and regular. So in this sense, so now maybe I will restrict to SL, to SLN, regular nilpotent just means that your matrix is conjugated to this matrix with just one Jordan block. So in some sense, it's the, the nilpotent matrix of maximal rank. So if you want, Hitchin also starts from this, from the principal nilpotent uh, Higgs field, and then, so what Hitchin does, actually he deforms it in what is called a companion matrix, or sometimes it's called a Frobenius matrix, or sometimes it's called um, a principal slice. So he deforms it in this way. So we have some principal nilpotent element and some differentials in the last column. And so what is our idea? Our idea is to, to, to take, uh, to, to stay with the nilpotent matrix. So we still have the same matrix here actually, but we add another matrix which commutes with this one. And actually it's a simple exercise to show that the matrices which commute with this matrix are just the powers of it. So we have just some parameter mu two times this matrix. And then the square is just the diagonal just under it and so on, and at the very end you have just something here. Alexander, be aware that people barely see what you are written on the map. Ah, uh, okay, um, it's, it's better. Oh, I can maybe just put it on for some moment. This maybe, no. This, is it better? 
Okay, that's not the, mo it's not the most important part. But just if you write it like this, you really see that we have now the same number of degrees of freedom. So just imposing nil, pot nil potency gives the same number of degrees of freedom. Okay, so this were, these were the two really maybe complicated slides. And uh, now we come back to um, new things. So I will uh, not assume, uh, not, I will not assume much of knowledge, pre-knowledge. And so here's the, the plan of the talk. So uh, I will present this, this, uh, this puncture Hilbert scheme. Then I will construct this new geometric structure, this higher complex structure. And in particular, we will see its moduli space and why it should be the same as Hitchin component. And at the end, I will give some recent developments. In particular, there's some interesting GL2 action and something about higher mapping class groups. Okay. So, puncture Hilbert schemes, or more generally Hilbert schemes, is something which exists in really great generality. It was uh, developed by Grotendieck. So the idea is you have, a, you have some scheme, and the Hilbert scheme actually parameterizes all sub-schemes of some type. Um, maybe an example you can have in mind if you just have a vector space and you look at all sub-vector spaces of some given dimension. This is just the Grossmannian, and it turns out that the Grossmannian is a manifold. So if you look at all sub-schemes of some type, it turns out that this is again a scheme. But in our case, really, we are in a very, very simple special case. We are in the case of C2. So our scheme is just C2. We have just polynomials and two variables. And we look at all sub-schemes of dimension zero. So in some sense, really just points. That's why it's called punctual Hilbert scheme of the plane. But even this seems maybe too difficult. So we can really think about it in this way. So we just take n points of the plane, C2, but the only thing which, what we have to do is we have to ignore their order. So this is called the configuration space, C2 to the n divided out by the, yeah, by the symmetry group. The problem with this space is that it turns out that it's not uh, smooth, it's singular, because the action of the symmetry group is not free whenever several points coincide. And so we want to, yeah, in some sense, desingularize this, uh, this space. Whenever several points coincide, we need some extra information. And the idea to go there is the following. So you consider these endpoints as an algebraic variety, meaning that these endpoints are defined by some equations, polynomial equations. And these equations form an ideal, I, and this ideal I has some specific property. So when you look at the function space over your variety, so what is this function space? You have all functions, C of x, y, but whenever you have a function which lies in your ideal, uh, you just see zero, right? Because it's exactly the ideal which defines your points. So the, the functions on your variety is this quotient. But in this, in this case, we have just n points. So a function is just a, a value for each point. So this, in our case here, is just t, c to the n. So the ideal is of co-dimension n. And in fact, this is already the definition of the Hilbert scheme, just the, 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 the set of ideas of co-dimension n. And if you look what happens when you have several points and you take the limit of these ideals whenever several points coincide, you will see actually that there are, there are degrees of freedom. So they retain some extra information. Uh, Alexander, for somebody like me who doesn't know that, can we give, for example, something very simple for two points, or is just something like, say, it's an idea? Uh, I, will, I will give examples. I will give, I will give examples in a minute. Just uh, maybe the formal definition. So this puncture Hilbert scheme of the plane, as I already said, actually is the space of ideals of co-dimension n. So here, just I wrote it out. And there's an interesting subspace, which is um, these ideals, the ideals where the algebraic variety is just the origin, meaning that all the points are collapsed together at the origin. 
And so Ethereum, going back to Grotendieck and Fogarty, and which was also um, better understood in, by Heimann, states that this Hilbert scheme is actually a smooth algebraic variety. It's of dimension 2n, and it is a desangularization of the configuration space. Or if you prefer, it's something like a minimal blow up of the configuration space. Maybe also I could state for the zero fiber, one knows that it's um, an irreducible algebraic variety, it's not smooth, and it's of dimension n minus one. Okay, so let's see if we have some examples. So take n points, distinct, and say also generic. We'll see what, uh, what does it mean. And now we try to, to find um, polynomial equations which will be zero on these points. Maybe the first guess or the first thing you could do is to think about this Lagrange interpolation polynomial. So giving n points, there is, um, in, for generic points, there is a unique uh, polynomial of degree n minus one interpolating these points. So we have one generator. And now we need a second curve which intersects this one in our n points. And maybe a quite natural choice would just be to take a function which only depends on x or just the product of x minus xi, where the xi are the coordinates of my, x, my, of my points. Because now geometrically I see that the intersection of these two curves are precisely my endpoints. And so the ideal generated by these two will exactly define these endpoints. So here I wrote it out. So here the second generator is this Lagrange interpolation polynomial. I call mu i the coefficients. And this first one is just uh, spending out the product of x minus x i. So what do you see in the zero fiber? In the zero fiber, all these x i will be zero. So the first polynomial will just be x to the m. And the Lagrange interpolation polynomial is still arbitrary, but it has to go through the origin. So the mu one term is zero. And so here you see actually that we have n minus one degrees of freedom. So this is the generic ideal in the zero fiber. So maybe I can say that um, there, are, there are elements which are not of this form. There are elements with, with, which have three generators, for example, but the generic one with the maximum number of degrees of freedom is exactly this one. So yeah, one might say maybe roughly speaking, this, the zero fiber describes like, like something like jets of, of uh, of curves at the origin. And in particular, the zero fiber for the two-point Hilbert scheme is the following. So you have one point which is already in the origin, and then the other point uh, will collapse to the origin, and what the zero fiber, what the Hilbert scheme retains as extra information is just the direction from which this particle comes. So this is just CP1, just the uh, yeah, space of directions in C2. Okay, but I, I said earlier that the Hilbert scheme is something like the space of commute, commuting matrices. So it is true that there is a completely equivalent um, description of the Hilbert scheme using just linear algebra. And this goes as follows. So when I give you two commuting matrices, then they, they are, you can simultaneously trigonalize them putting them into upper triangular form in sing, um, simultaneously. And then you can just associate the endpoints given by coordinates x i, y i. So this gives you endpoints. And this simultaneous trig trigonalization process is unique up to permutation, you know, action of the permutation matrices. So you get actually endpoints without order. So now you see the link at least to this generic picture of endpoints without order. To be more precise, really to, to describe really the precise link, we have to look at the, uh, at the ideals. How can we associate to two matrices an ideal? Or the other way around, how to associate to an ideal commuting matrices. And this goes as follows. It's easier actually to, to start with the ideal. So once you have an ideal, you have a vector space, which is this quotient, the space of functions. 
And in this space of functions, there are two natural operators, the multiplication by x and the multiplication by y. These are matrices of, of uh, size n. They commute because x and y commute. And finally, there's a last property, which is a little bit technical, which just says that um, the whole vector space is generated by one vector once you act by your matrices mx and my. So this is called a cyclic vector. And so there's the following proposition. The Hilbert scheme is precisely the set of matrices, of pairs of matrices which commute, which admit a cyclic vector, moduli, moduli, modulo conjugation. In order to prove the proposition, it's actually sufficient just to give you the inverse construction. Okay, yeah, the question is what is the cyclic vector? So a cyclic vector means it's, it's, it's some vector such that when you act by mx and my, okay. you take the span of all this, you generate the whole vector space. So in this, in this setting, for example, you can just take one. You take one, you multiply by x by y, you will get actually everything. So what is the inverse construction? Uh, starting from two matrices which commute, you can look at all polynomials which, um, which will be zero on them. So you use actually the commutativity in the definition because uh, it has to be well defined. Uh, in order to be well defined, A and B have to, have to commute. And it turns out that this is always an ideal. And the fact that there is a cyclic vector actually proves that this ideal is of co-dimension N. So, yeah, the proposition is proven. And maybe a remark, um, when you look at the zero fiber, the zero fiber in this matrix viewpoint corresponds precisely to nilpotent matrices. Because when you trigonalize them, you have just zeros on the diagonal. Okay, so now we have understood this puncture Hilbert scheme, ideal viewpoint, matrix viewpoint, and now we want to construct a geometric structure on the surface. Higher complex structures. But before going to that, maybe one might ask, um, how can you describe the usual complex structure with this puncture Hilbert scheme? So in the, all the sequel, I will denote by sigma a smooth closed surface of genus at least two. And one knows that in the dimension two, a complex structure can be always described by an, what is called an almost complex structure. So this is an endomorphism of square minus the identity, something like multiplication by i. And this is encoded in a decomposition of the complexified tangent bundle, like a one zero part and a zero one part. So actually these two parts, this decomposition is just the, the eigen decomposition of this operator j, this operator of square minus the identity. But actually these two directions, which, what you have, um, they are conjugated to each other. So here we use the natural complex structure just coming from the complexification. So actually, when you give me one direction, then I can deduce the other just by complex conjugation. And these two together define me the complex structure. So the complex structure is uniquely encoded by giving me at each point a direction in the complexified tangent bundle. So I can see it as a section of the projectivization of this complexified tangent bundle. And there's just one small condition. When, you, when I give you a direction and I conjugate it, they have to be different because they correspond to different eigenvalues. So that's just something, uh, something like a reality constraint. And we just, we've just seen that this projectivization is the Hilbert scheme of two points, the zero five of the Hilbert scheme for two points. So written like this, I think it's quite tempting to guess the definition of higher complex structures. But there will be one small change. We will not use the tangent bundle, but the cotangent bundle. So for the usual complex structure, this is exactly the same. A complex structure is an operator 
acting on the cotangent bundle of square minus the identity. It's, it's completely equivalent. And you will see the advantage of the cotangent bundle is that it has a symplectic structure. Okay, so if there's no question, then here we go for the definition of the higher complex structure. So we also call it the N complex structure. And it's a section of the zero fiber of the N point Hilbert scheme uh, of the complexified cotangent bundle. So you really have to understand that it's something which we apply point wise. So at each point you have a two dimensional vector space, which is this T star complexified sigma. And we apply it point wise and then we take a section of this. And we need an extra condition which corresponds to this reality condition, stating that um, yeah, the sum i plus i bar um, has to be the maximal ideal supported at the origin. Yeah, this is just, so for n equals two actually, this definition is exactly the, um, it's exactly the, the complex structure. So maybe some, some notation. So I fix some reference complex structure, zz bar on sigma. So it's important to stress that we don't fix, a, how do you say, it's not something, so our construction does not depend really on it. It's just to write it down. And then we, and then we fix some coordinates in the, in the cotangent bundle, we denote it by p and p bar. And so locally, our ideals, are given by this formula. So this is what we have seen already before. So we have p to the n, this was our x to the n before, and then we have some Lagrange interpolation polynomial. So we have n minus one functions, mu two, mu three, and so on. And actually, for n equals two, we only have one term, which is the mu two, and it turns out that this mu two is just what classically is known as the Beltrami differential. And so these, mu3, mu4, and so on, we call it higher Beltrami differentials. It's just a, yes, a higher version of, of, of it. And in particular, this um, reality constraint just on mu2 is, uh, yeah, the condition which is well known, it's, which says that mu2, mu2 bar is not equal to one. So this is for n, equal, for n equals two, we have this condition, and this is the usual condition uh, on Beltrami differentials. Okay, so we have our complex, higher complex structure. Maybe I can give you some idea how to think about it. So we use the different viewpoints we have seen um, about the Hilbert scheme. So I've said that the Hilbert scheme is something like uh, a jet of a curve at the origin. So here we do it at every point of the surface. So what you get is something like, yes, something like a hairy surface. But don't forget that these hairs are in the complexified cotangent bundle. But you can also maybe think about it as um, a complex curve, a germ of a complex curve, um, which um, along the zero section in the com complexified cotangent bundle. So you have, you have sigma, which is inside the complexified cotangent bundle, and you have a germ along, along the zero section here inside. You can see it as, as this. Another way to put it is to say, okay, the zero section, the zero fiber, is the collapse of several points. So if I have several points in each cotangent space, this gives me actually a ramified cover. And at the, at the end, I have actually to collapse this cover to the, to the zero section. So the, yeah, you can see it as, as, um, yeah, as a collapse of an n-fold cover to the zero section, which actually gives this, this n minus one jet of a complex surface. And finally, we have this matrix viewpoint. So we can see a higher complex structure actually as a one form on our surface, which locally can be written like phi one dz plus phi two dz bar, where phi one and phi two are two commuting nilpotent matrices. Actually, to be more precise, it's, it's a conjugacy class of such objects.
Okay, so now we have our structure, but we want to define some moduli space. And what we do usually for complex structures is to do, divide out by isotopies, by, by diffeomorphisms isotopic to the identity. But it turns out that in our case, this would be not sufficient to get a finite dimensional moduli space. We need a bigger group. And the good notion, it turns out, is the following. We actually we see why we, we use, we need the cotangent bundle. So what we, what, we, what we need are simple ectomorphisms of the cotangent bundle, which are Hamiltonian, so generated by some function, and which preserve the zero section setwise, not pointwise. So this we call higher diffeomorphisms, and actually you will see that it acts on our structure. So if you want, on the zero section, on sigma, you just see a usual diffeomorphism, but in the fibers you can have Nonlinear transformations, right? Maybe also what you can think is if you take a poly, when you take a Hamiltonian on the cotangent bundle, which is polynomial, it gives you some polynomial change, and this is actually why we need these uh, these uh, higher diffeomorphisms because our structure is something like polynomial in the cotangent space. So how does it act? How does these higher diffeomorphisms act? So one, you might just say that, okay, roughly speaking, um, higher diffeomorphisms act on the cotangent bundle, so they also act on the complexified cotangent bundle. They also act on n tuples of points on this cotangent bundle, and also when they are collapsed to the zero section, they should all still act. So roughly speaking, this is actually the, the, the argument. It acts on n tuples, and then also when you when you collapse all together to the origin, it still acts. But still, so if you want to write it down precisely, when you have a higher complex structure given by an ideal with two generators p and q, and you have a higher diffeomorphism generated by some Hamiltonian function h, we can compute actually the the variation. The variation is given by some Poisson bracket. This is just standard uh, in symplectic geometry, and you have to mod out by i, because what you want to understand is the, the variation of an ideal. And so if you stay in the ideal, you will not change anything. Actually, the, actually these formulas are similar to the tangent space of Grossmannians. You have always to caution out uh, the, sp the space where you are. And the first theorem we obtained, describing the local theory of our geometric structure is the following. It states that any two higher complex structures locally are equivalent. Meaning that there is no local invariant. Something like the symplectic structure. Locally there should be some model, some canonical model. So this also means that the only interesting geometry in the structure lies in the global theory. And so we can define the moduli space in the following yeah, direct way. We just take the set of all higher complex structures and we quotient out by higher diffeomorphisms. So we denote the space by Tn hat. Um, Yes, and hitching component, I think it will not be so often, but whenever I speak about the hitching component, it will be Tn, without the hat. And then we get the following theorem, describing this moduli space. So we can show that it's contractible, it's a manifold which is contractible and of complex dimension n square minus one times g minus one. The um, quite surprising thing is there's a forgetful map going from Tn hat to Tn minus one hat. You can just forget one of the higher Beltrami differentials. You have a copy of Teichmüller space inside. And when you take a point on this copy, we can compute its cotangent space at this point, and you just see the Hitchin base. So, and at this point, it's really the, the, the image I gave you before. It's something like Hitchin describes actually this, this space just 
from one point, as the cotangent space of one point. And finally, we also get nearly for free, actually, a mapping class group invariant complex structure. Because all our construction is completely coming from the, the surface. So the mapping class group acts on it naturally. And uh, the complex structure, we get it by the explicit description of the cotangent bundle. So this seems really great. So the, the main conjecture, of course, is that this moduli space is canonically diffeomorphic to Hitchens component. And maybe now I will just compare them, what we know about them for the moment. So we know that for both the Hitchin component and our space, they are contractible, contractible manifolds. They are, they are of the same dimension. We know for both that there is a mapping class group action, but already in the case of the Hitchin component, this is a quite difficult theorem. It's from uh, the, uh, theorem of due to library, I think in 2008. So it's quite recent compared to Hitchin's paper. And yeah, it's considered as a difficult. Uh, you, you need some displacement property to, to show it. So in our case, we have a natural complex structure. In the Hitchin component, we don't know. We have just some parametrization of some component. But on the other side, for the Hitchin component, we have a symplectic structure because the character varieties always have some uh, symplectic structure due to Atia Bot and uh, due to Goldman. But on our side, we don't really know. In our construction, there's no symplectic structure coming out. And so you see, if they, they are uh, diffeomorphic, this would be great because this would give us a symplectic, a symplectic structure and a complex structure. And so one might hope, actually, that these both together combine to a Keller structure. Again, for the Hitchin component, we don't know anything about the cotangent bundle because we just have a parametrization. And in our case, we have an explicit description of the space. And finally, uh, forgetful map. So in our case, we have this forgetful map. We don't really know about the fiber. It should be something like uh, holomorphic and differentials. But it's, it's probably not a vector bundle. It should be more like an affine bundle. But all this is not so clear. And for Hitchin components, this forgetful map is, apart from n equals 3, uh, completely new. So for n equals 3, there's a map from, um, from um, convex projective structures to complex structures, where the fiber actually is known, given by holomorphic cubic differentials. This is this uh, work of, um, um, oh, I forgot. Um, Yeah, I, I will find it. I will find it later. later. Okay, so how can we attack our attack, our conjecture? So the idea is the following. Um, again, we will maybe simulate a little bit Hitchens' approach. So, in order to find these components in the in the real character variety for the real group PSLN of R, we have to look at the complex character variety, PSLN of C. And in the dictionary of the non-abelian Hodge correspondence, um, the complex character variety corresponds to the moduli space of Higgs bundles. And inside, you have the Sitchin section, which corresponds to the real character variety. So we hope that the Hitchin component corresponds to our moduli space. So one, can, one might ask what corresponds to the complex character variety. The answer should be the cotangent bundle of our moduli space. And we've already seen that for some points, actually the, the locus of this copy of Teichmuller space, uh, this cotangent space is the Hitchin base. So we know that it's of the right dimension. And we, already, we also can describe this cotangent space at any point. So this is the following theorem. So the co total cotangent bundle is described by higher Beltrami differentials, mu, and by some differentials, t, which satisfy this compatibility condition, which seems quite horrible. 
But in the simple case where all the mu's are zero, for trivial higher complex structure, this condition just reads del bar tk zero. Just, just reduces to usual holomorphicity. So I really like to think about this equation, this condition as some higher holomorphicity condition. We have differentials t which are higher holomorphic or holomorphic with respect to this higher complex structure mu. So what is the idea to, to, to link now the first column to the second column? How, how, can, we, how can we get from yeah, the moduli space of higher complex structures to flat connections? The idea is the following. You have these coordinates, mu and t, on this cotangent bundle, and you deform them into what I call mu, mu hat and t hat. So you, you deform them with some parameter h, and um, you give explicitly, actually, uh, a, metro, um, a connection. So what you see here is, like in Hitchin's case, you have a companion matrix, and here you have a second matrix with the first column given by the mu hat. And the stars actually are explicitly given by mu hat and t hat, just by the flatness condition. So we want this connection to be flat. So everywhere where I don't write anything, it's zero. Oh, it's okay. So you see, for example, if I put h equals to zero, all the t's disappear because t hat is h times something. So you really just get uh, the principal nilpotent matrix. And what you get here, the second matrix, is what I wrote here. So it's just uh, the matrix commuting with this principal nilpotent element. So we really get a deformation of this. And we ask for this connection to be flat. Because in the sense, we get a link to this character variety. Okay, it may not work anymore. No, why? No, it may not work. Oh. Ah, okay, I'm not, pre oh, okay, now I can. <laughs> yes, okay. So maybe two remarks on this connection. Um, it is gauge equivalent to, um, to a connection which is quadratic in H. So we really have the same picture as for Hitchin's case, but now our phi has two components, phi one and phi two. And these are nilpotent. And the second quite important remark is when t, when the coordinates t are zero, we should get a flat connection with real monotonicity. Meaning that when we are in our moduli space, seen as the zero section of the cotangent bundle of the moduli space, so exactly at the points where t is zero, this should correspond to the real character variety. And so this, this whole program is worked out quite in detail, but there are still some problems. In particular, we don't really know if this deformation is canonic, if it's canonically associated to mu t. So this would be quite important, actually, to have yeah, unicity, for example. Okay, so in the remaining time, I have maybe 20 minutes, something like this, um, I will speak about some recent developments. So, I did my, so do, do you get a proof for your conjecture, or this is like a... Like okay. Or what is the yes, okay, so there's a, the... the Somebody asked, what is the status precisely of the conjecture? So I still consider it as a conjecture, because there are still some details which might be quite important, which are not solved. So, heuristically, everything should be clear. We have equations, we can, we see that we have one unknown for each equation, but still, it's not so clear why it should have a solution on the whole Riemann surface. Often we just uh, work in local coordinates. We have to check if it's glues together. So yeah, it's, for now it's still a conjecture, but there are several parts which are really proven, but uh, yeah, there are also parts which are missing.
Okay, so some recent developments. So the idea here is to, maybe at least in your head, you can imagine that our modular space is equivalent to Hitchin space, Hitchin's component, but actually I only will speak about this modular space. So it is interesting by its own, but if it is equivalent to Hitchin's component, it will be even much more inter interesting because, it will, because there will be links to subjects which are already treated or which are already studied. So first of all, I take the SL2 case. So in the SL2 case, maybe I haven't said it, but in the SL2 case, our modular space is really just Teich Müller space because we have really just usual complex structures and I forgot maybe to mention that these higher diffeomorphisms, they don't, um, they don't act actually, most of them act trivially. And in particular for n equals two, they all act trivially apart from usual diffeomorphisms. So, so for n equals two, our modular space is just Teich Müller space. And the cotangent bundle of Teich Müller space it has an interesting description as the space of half translation surfaces. So we know that the space is described by holomorphic quadrat quadratic differentials. And when I take such a quadratic holomorphic differential T, I can give you a chart, local charts given by the square root of T integrated, which have the following properties. So when I change my charts, I just, the, the coordinate changes are either translations or maybe a composition with minus the identity. This minus identity just comes from the sign uh, of the square root. You can pick plus or minus. And so you get actually a flat structure on your surface. So you can imagine your surface coming from some polygon where you identify some, um, some edges which are parallel, either in a direct way, way or maybe by a switch of 180 degree. So here I give you just an example where O corresponds to O, X to X, and uh, the arrows correspond to each other, but with a flip. So you can understand actually the cotangent bundle of Teichmiller space as the space of such structures, these half translation surfaces. And there's a natural GL2R action on the space of polygons. You just act by your matrix on R2. So often one restricts to surfaces with unit area, and so one has to restrict to SL2. And so this, this action is quite important. It's really linked to this dynamics of Teichmüller flow, of Teichmüller disks, or complex geodesics. And we had another talk, uh, we, had, we had already a talk about this. And so the question is, does this action generalize? The answer is yes. So there is a GL2R action on our cotangent bundle to the modular space. So I can describe it quite easily. So we have seen that there are coordinates given by T and mu. And actually, how, how do we get these coordinates? Um, if you remember back when I wrote an ideal uh, in the Hilbert scheme, you had these two elements. You had the um, Lagrange interpolation polynomial, it's the second line, and you had some polynomial only depending on x, that's the first line. And so actually these two equations, they took place actually in the complexified cotangent bundle. So actually in my earlier notations you should replace x by p and y by p bar. So we have these equations which are valid at least locally on your surface, and now, uh, GL2R, um, you can describe it in this form. So these are matrices uh, of this form. So A and B here are complex. A, B bar, B, A bar. So it's not so, it's quite easy exercise to show that this, these are isomorphic. And then you can act on X and Y. So this, such a matrix, it uses an action on x and y. So actually, maybe you should think of x and y bar. So if I take just this matrix and I act on the, the vector x, y bar, what I get is ax plus b bar, y bar. 
This is the first line. And the second line, when I conjugate it, I exactly get B x plus a bar y bar. So I just conjugated it in order to stay with our variables x, y. So this gives you an action on x, y, and via the equations, which links uh, x and y to t and mu, we also get an action on t and mu. So an action on, on this cotangent bundle. So maybe a, a remark, it's, I was a little bit sloppy here because actually t and mu are not coordinates of the space. Um, because you have to quotient out this, the, the action of higher diffeomorphisms. So actually we only, we only have equivalence classes of t and mu, but it's not, easy, it's not difficult to show that this action descends to the quotient. So we know that this action exists. Uh, but for the moment, I'm not an expert on dynamical systems, so there's really space, I think, uh, to study this action much more in detail. Are there generalizations of the reach group? Um, yeah, what is the dynamics generated by, by, by this action? Uh, can you see it geometrically as some geodesic flow? All these questions are not studied at all for the moment. Another aspect, is what I'm studying quite recently is thinking about something like a generalization and extension of the mapping class group. So we have seen that on the space of higher complex structures, we define this action of higher diffeomorphisms. So higher diffeomorphisms, they, I describe them as Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms of the cotangent bundle which, are, which preserve the zero section. So here I call them Ham Sigma of T star Sigma. So Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms of T star Sigma, which preserve the zero section Sigma. But actually, why should I restrict to Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms? I can just consider the space of all symplectomorphisms, preserving the zero section. And of course, this space also acts on our, on our higher complex structures. So in particular, the quotient of them will act on our moduli space. So the question would be, what is this quotient? So there's some... Oh. Oh, somebody, something happened. I'm sorry, but we are not connected anymore. Can you hear me? Mm, I hope so. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, this, this at least works. So at least for you, it will be okay. I hope that, that it's okay also for the audience. Yes, okay. They say that it's yes. Okay. So there's some recent work actually uh, in the symplectic geometry uh, which try to understand uh, this relation between Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms and um, the identity component of the symplectomorphism group. And using yeah, these, these results of Ono and Banyaga, it, it's quite easy to show actually that this group of Hamiltonian um, diffeomorphisms preserving the zero section is precisely the identity component of the space of symplectomorphisms preserving the zero section. So what does this mean? This means that when I take the quotient, this is a discrete group, because it's just something like a group divided by, uh, yes, the component of the identity. So this is discrete, and of course, and there's, a, there's a link to the mapping class group. So first, when I just look on, on, on my surface, what happens on my surface? So when I restrict the symplectomorphism, I just see any diffeomorphism, and a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism is, yeah, diffeomorphism is a topic to the identity. So if I look at the quotient, I just get the mapping class group. So if you want, I have a map from this quotient I have a map from this to the mapping class group. 
just by looking at what happens on sigma. But there's also a map going the other way around because any diffeomorphism on the surface can be extended to a symplectomorphism of the cotangent bundle. This is just known as symplectic um, extension. So we can actually extend it linearly. So you have a copy of the mapping class group here. So the question is, is this quotient actually strictly bigger than the mapping class group? So if it is bigger, then so I, I would call this quotient something like higher mapping class group, or maybe extended mapping class group, but there, there are too much higher things in my talk. So um, yes, but so I don't know about this. I don't know about, uh, about the answer of this question. So I know that this quotient acts on our moduli space, uh, just the same argument as for Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. And maybe the hope is the following. So when you take n equals to two, the Teichmüller space, when you quotient out by the mapping class group, you get just the Riemann moduli space. And we know that there are lots of nice properties. In particular, it's quasi-projective. Uh, there are nice compactifications, like the linear Mumford compactifications. And once you have the compactifications, you can be interested in intersection numbers and all this. But apparently for Hitchin components, when you quotient out by the mapping class group action, this is not a nice space. So I'm not an expert on this, but apparently it's not quasi-projective and this, is, this causes lots of problems. You cannot really compactify it in a nice way. And so the hope is that if this quotient is really strictly bigger, maybe the quotient of our moduli space by this higher mapping class group would give maybe a, a, nice, a nice space some quasi-projective space which we can compactify, some generalization of the linear Mumford, and then also we can generalize intersection numbers and all this. So this is the big hope here for this, for this branch of research. How many time do I have? Two, three minutes? Yeah, two minutes. Two minutes, okay. But I have a last slide just to generalizing or giving just some ideas what we can do with uh, higher complex structures. So for the moment, I always I have spe I've spoken only about SLN, so hitching components for PSLN of R. So you m one might ask, what about other Lie algebras, other Lie groups? And so I have a paper which generalizes it to other Lie, alg uh, Lie algebras, semi-simple complex Lie algebras. So there's a notion actually a new notion, I, I introduced it, um, of a G-Hilbert scheme. So actually what, is, what I can generalize is this matrix viewpoint. You have something like the space of commuting elements of Lie algebra. Um, you need some, yeah, some, some condition which generalizes this condition of, of the cyclic vector, and you, can, you quotient out by, um, by conjugacy. So there's a notion of some Hilbert scheme for, for Lie algebra, and this leads to the definition of a G-complex structure. So for SL2, we get a complex structure. For SLN, we get a higher complex structure. And here, for other Lie groups like SO or SP, we get something new. And so the hope is the same that it should describe, the moduli space of these structures should describe Hitching components. But actually in these cases, uh, our conjecture or our proof idea is even more uh, sketchy. So there are much more things which we haven't proven than for the SL2 case, SLN case. Okay, and finally maybe I just mention uh, some possible links. So these higher complex structures are some new ingredient in the space, uh, in the field of higher Teichmüller theory, and there's lots of ideas and lots of um, concepts around, and they should be linked, or at least you could look at them through this, uh, this viewpoint of higher complex structures. So there should be a link to OPERS, to spectral networks, uh, W-algebras, cluster varieties, mirror symmetry. Why is it not working? <laughs> <laughs> nearly ended, okay. Okay, I will not do it. 
yeah, some, should be some link to mirror symmetry. And maybe, yeah, if you have uh, questions, we can discuss it uh, during the question time or, or afterwards. Uh, because uh, there are, of course, some, I have more precise idea about the links to this. I will not just putting it like this here, but I'm running out of time. So um, probably I cannot show you the thank you uh, <laughs> slide. I will try. No, it's not, not working. Okay, so I'm sorry. Um, yeah, the last slide, of course, is today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Alexander, for, for the talk. <laughs> Do you have any questions? You can also quest, uh, put questions in the, in the chat. Okay, there's a question about this link to OPERS. Um, so an OPER is some notion on a Riemann surface of what a differential operator should be. And in the case of OPERS, again, you fix a complex structure. You take a Riemann surface and you, you look at differential equations which or you should you look at some object which should generalize uh, an equation like this, uh, t2n minus 2 tn psi equals to zero. So we have an, an ordinary linear differential equation of order n. Um, you can see it as a flat connection in some, some, in some bundle. And yeah, so in order to formulate this on a Riemann surface, you need some filtrations and uh, Yes, and so the, actually what you, so this is an ordinary equation, but in some sense it, you say that psi has to be holomorphic, meaning that you have actually this system to solve. So the idea would be to have an OPER, not with respect to a fixed complex structure, but with respect to some higher complex structure. And so in particular you have to re replace this operator by something different. So it should, it's not completely this, but at least to giving you an idea, it should be something like this. It's not precisely that, but it uh, should be a deformation of uh, the stell bar by the higher complex structure. Yes, exactly, yes. It's not exactly this. Um, yeah, I can explain you what it should be. It's some, it's some functions on the Beltrami differential at least, yes. So there is a hope to define, yeah, to, to define this object, and even better, so once you, once you mix them up, you have opers together with Beltrami differentials, and these Beltrami differentials, they should correspond to a Hitchens component. And there is already in the literature some correspondence between opers and Hitchin components. This is this conformal limit, and hopefully in this, in this viewpoint, you should actually yeah, understand both together at once. This would be the, the hope. Can you do this with punctures? Sorry, can I? With punctures on surface. Oh, okay, yes. Um, the question is whether I can deal with punctures. Um, I never really thought about punctures, but at least for boundary components. Mm -hmm. This is maybe actually the link to W algebras. So W algebras are, uh, yeah, something like differential operators on the circle. So for example, for the, the complex structure, you have the, the action of the Virasoro algebra, which is the W algebra of SL2. And um, these also act uh, on opers, because something like an OPER is defined over C or C star, and C star is something like the complexification of the circle. But whenever you add both, when you have both together, actually it will not act anymore, um, because it's something really defined on the circle. But once you allow for boundary components, you have a, uh, a surface with boundary components, then uh, this W algebra should act on, on, on these opers. Uh, but uh, so for a boundary component, you have to think about a good condition. What does it mean for these ideals to be on the boundary? Uh, even for punctures, it's maybe even less obvious what it should be. At least for the viewpoint of character varieties, yes, notion of parabolic Higgs bundles. And so we know that we should, for example, prescribe the monotonomy around these punctures. So yeah, at least from, from the character 
variety viewpoint, we know what it should be, so we can maybe think about what should correspond to this in, in our setting, but I never really thought about it in detail. This is not a possible question. If you take, for example, the disk with the two, two punctures. With the two punctures? Or? Disk with, small, with punctures, uh, then... You should get the braid group? Or? Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah, that's true, yeah. Uh, this should give some braid group action on, I don't know, on on opers, on generalized opers of, of the punctured disk. Yeah, probably. I could not say anything intelligent on that. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Do you have any description of the tension bundle of your model space? Um, a good question, but actually, what, when we describe uh, our cotangent bundle, so it's, I think it's quite the same story as for Teichmuller space. So the tangent bundle of Teichmuller space, not sure if there's so nice uh, description of it, no. It's something like uh, the variation of the Beltrami differential quotient out by something, so it's some quotient. Um, that's why actually uh, when you go to the cotangent bundle, it's easier because uh, the quotient, the dual of a quotient becomes some annihilator. Um, yeah, I couldn't say anything. It might be interesting, but I'm not sure if there's an interesting answer in the Teichmuller space for Teichmuller space. Okay. There's another question. Can we say something about the Peterson inner product on the cotangent space of your modular space? Yeah, also a good question, but actually the, this Peterson, so for Teichmuller space, the Peterson metric gives you the symplectic structure. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I have the really impression that in our approach, it's really difficult to see any symplectic structure. So probably it should also be difficult to, to see some Peterson inner product. Yeah, well, maybe one might do something with these differentials. And for Peterson, you, you have this t, t, t bar, and you divide it by the, the hyperbolic metric. In our case, you have higher differentials, but first of all, they are not holomorphic. They are something like higher holomorphic. And then you have to quotient out by, by something in order to get some, something you can integrate. It's not so obvious. Okay, so maybe we can thank you again together.